Ted, can you hear me? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Is there a way in this uh, vMix call to change cameras? I can't find the settings anywhere. Um, not sure. I mean, I could see you. Do you, do you have two okay. cameras? Yeah, I have multiple cameras. How's the sound sound like? Is there an echo or anything like that? Uh, it sounds fine. Uh, the uh, voice is a bit low, or the music is a bit uh, high, high. One yeah. of the two. There's also another link, the beta.vmix. You could try that one. Okay, I'll give that a call. I'll be right back. Okay. That nice blurry background going. Yeah, yeah. Don't need people to see my uh, junk. <laughs> For those who are watching the replay, you can go ahead and skip this. Uh, this is just a countdown for me getting ready for our live stream in about eight minutes. So if you're watching the replay, go ahead and please skip this. if people need the settings you have to make it full screen then the settings icon appears is that for the was that the beta one or the short link it might be both uh, but but i found it on the beta okay
One minute, one minute. Show. Hey. 
Hey, hey, what's up, guys? Episode number eight, another episode of the SEO Video Show. My name is Paul Andre Devera, a.k.a. Dre. Thank you for coming. A shout out to everyone that came from SIA, IMG, the Browsio group. I see all of you here. Um, Barrier Search, thank you for coming out. I want to give a shout out to my nephew who says he's watching, Loki Enzo. Um, let's go ahead and get this show started. Before, before that, please don't forget to subscribe and like and share the show. And let's get this going. This is Ted DiBiase, the Million Dollar Man. <laughs> what kind of fruit do SEOs like best? Low hanging. <laughs> All right, our first piece of news is from Google. They are currently piloting a new reporting system for security issues. I put the link in the description and you can check that out. And another part of um, Google, uh, their SEO myth busting episode was just released. And they're talking about site migrations, which is really interesting. They actually talked about one thing that a lot of people forget are 301 redirecting your images, your image URLs. I didn't know that. Um, I mean, I actually don't really I didn't think about that, but that's something you should also check out. But let's also check out the myth that they de they debunk on traffic. The biggest myth is that you will always experience a drop in traffic with a domain name change oh, or site migration. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think that's a very good one because uh, the answer to it is it depends, as you know. So a lot of times people are not understanding what a site move is. So if you are literally just moving from one domain to the other, copying pretty much the entire URL structure and the entire content over, um, then you not necessarily see a drop of traffic. I mean, you will see that traffic drops off over time on one domain and picks up on the other. But overall, that doesn't really mean that you have a traffic drop. You're not losing traffic. If we can do this very clean move, then there's not really going to be like a drop period where one, one drops and then the other picks up, but there's more like a fluid transition. Got it. There you have it. I mean, I've heard this a lot before and I've been fortunate enough to any migrations I've done and any new like redesign and new pages, I've was able to get a lot more traffic with all the performance enhancements that we've had. And just, but when you do a site migration, there's some audits you should always do, right? And one, one audit that I think some people actually forget um, is about the sitemap. Let's have Pam Onks uh, tell us about this. And XML sitemaps in terms of using that for audits. A lot of SEO companies or experts or in-house people, whoever is working on the site are like, oh, we have an XML sitemap and we submitted to Search Console, boom, we're done. Right. And my approach has been, have you looked at what's in there? When, it, when there's you know, new plugins added or themes added, some of those create new custom post types that then also end up in the XML sitemap. Right. And it may just be like sliders or something, you know, very thin content. Right. So I've always done that in my audits is taking a closer look other than just do they have one. Um, but lately I've been really digging deep in there because Google's getting pickier about content quality and right. thin content. And so I've been really encouraging people to take a much closer look. At, at least just at the very first step, just look at what post types are in there. Look into each one and you know, there's just so much old uh, stuff that accumulates over the years, you know, a test page or you know, some old content that's just not relevant anymore. So for content cleanup, basically. But basically, I'm just kind of on a mission lately like, to say to people, don't stop at making sure you have an XML sitemap and submitting it. Like, look at what's actually in it. There you have it. Check your sitemaps. You may have some pages that don't even belong in there. Don't trust your plugins. Um, do some manual check before you submit it. That's just something you should do. I should be doing myself. Uh, another piece of news is from Eric Eng Engel. 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 Eric Engel. Yeah. Uh, he talks about how deep or how in depth should your content be? Um, I found it pretty interesting of how much content he says we should be doing, but let's listen to what he has to have to say. How broad and how deep do we go with our content? And the answer is, well, first of all, as deep as possible and as broad as you can afford. 
basically we have to start thinking about things which are not the high volume keywords and what are the other aspects that uh, users are, are thinking about and wanting to know about. And so your content needs to go much deeper uh, regardless of your topic area to make sure that you're addressing the more detailed needs that people have. And this is really one of the big keys to, uh, to, to driving your SEO success here. With that kind of model in mind, the next question is, how deep really is deep enough? And how do I know when I've produced enough content? If you have 20 head terms, say, for your business, um, this might mean you need 200 pieces of content. And I'm not even sure the multiplier of 10 that I use there is enough. Uh, so it might even need to be more than that. Um, but the, the key thing is you have to get this culture in mind of getting really in depth in with your content, addressing those more specific needs, dedicating potentially full articles to them. By the way, some of those individual needs might have little to no search volume, but Google's looking for this. They're looking for your ability to address a higher percentage of visitors than the competing site that you're trying to outrank in the search results. And the more that you could do that, the better off you'll be in your overall SEO strategy. I, 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 I believe in that. I mean, not necessarily that much content, but I feel that we shouldn't talk about or just rely on search volume. I know a lot of my stakeholders and maybe clients will say, hey, so what's what's the search volume on that keyword or want to go after a keyword just because of search volume? Um, I think it's a bigger picture. You should actually do content around, um, you know, keyword clusters, topic clusters, whether the content is, you know, the keyword search volume is not as high. So that's some good information there. My last piece of news before I go on to my guest, my special guest today is, um, is by Judith Lewis. And she talks about backlinks. And like how there's two sides of the story, what Google tells you and what is real. I mean, um, my guest today is probably the biggest Google challenger out there, and we'll talk about that later. But let's listen to what Judith Lewis talks about on backlinks. There is Google's story about what's right and what's wrong. We all know Google, but there's always another side to every story. And we all know that what mom and dad say or what the teacher says isn't necessarily always what works. What does actually work? This is my list. I don't know, I assume this is going to go up on YouTube and live forever. So there you go, here's my list that I stand behind. Other ideas, you've got tons of things that you can do. You can news jack, you can do surveys, interviews. There's ego bait, ego bait works, buying links works. I always say never compensate a blogger for the link. Compensate them for the time that they have put into writing that piece of, of content. Why? It's a mentality difference. If you're just buying a link, they're thinking, ah, it's shit, I, I don't care. If you're paying them for their time, they're like, ah, I want to do a good job because this is about my craft, theoretically, and not about the link. But part of my brief to them is always make the content compelling enough that whoever reads it will want to click that link to get more information. There you have it. Um, with Google kind of like um, saying like buying links is bad. I mean, that's, that's just all hearsay. I think, I think we should um, look into your link strategy and really just kind of like, Hey, you know, buying links is not just that bad. I mean, we, my guest today actually has, I believe a new course on links. We can, we'll talk about it later, but that brings me up to my next slide here. The first rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. The second rule of Fight Club is you do not talk about Fight Club. All right, I'm talking about Fight Club. Today, my, my host, uh, my co-host today, my guest, my special guest is one of the smartest guys of SEO that I know. His name is um, Ted Kabaitis. I'm gonna go ahead and let you know a little bit about him. Ted got his start at the National Center of Supercomputing Applications and worked at Microsoft during the dot-com era. Then he was an in-house SEO for a large online retailer for 17 years. Ted is the CEO of the SEO tool, SEO tool Lab and the creator of Cora SEO Software. Ted is the host of the SEO Fight Club and he also speaks at SEO conferences on podcasts and dispelling numerous SEO myths and educating about scientific data-driven SEO solutions. 
Ted is a co-founder of Internet Marketing Gold, IMG. He is probably the most brilliant and scientific SEO I ever met and isn't afraid to go against the popular grain when he has data that says otherwise. Please welcome Ted Kabaitis. Thank you so much. Ted, welcome, welcome, welcome. How you doing, my man? Doing, doing good. Thank you for that intro. That's that's an awful lot of hype. Made me feel good. <laughs> you got it. You deserve it, man. You you are. I swear, like I like one of the smartest um, SEOs I've ever met. I've my whole my whole um, approach to SEO has changed when I first met you. I, I believe I first heard of you back in 2014 at an SEO rock stars. Um, yeah, 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 that's when I started coming out of hiding and letting people know what I'm doing. <laughs> I was in hiding for a long, long time, uh, just doing SEO and, and secrecy. So that was like when you was that one of your first speaking gigs that you actually did back in 2014? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, uh, I have to give credit where credit is due. Uh, Josh Bashinsky actually found me, uh, I responded on uh, search engine roundtable to a bunch of white hats in the comment threads with actual data, <laughs> and uh, that uh, mo that didn't have any effect on those white hats. But uh, Josh Bashinsky went, "Holy crap! Where did this guy get the data?" And you know that kind of got the ball rolling. He introduced me to Dory and SIA, and that's how I met Kyle and. You know, it's all downhill from there. Prior to that, I was just doing SEO research and, and secret, just running my scripts, collecting the data, measuring the facts. Yeah, you said so writing your own scripts. So you write your own, you, you actually create your own software called Quora, which is one of probably the the secret weapon of a lot of SEOs. It's my secret weapon. I guess it's out of the bag now. Um, I mean, I... I, every time I get a new client, it's so, I get a subscription for it for the month and run a bunch of reports. It's it's something that's very valuable. Can you tell people a little about Acora? Yeah, uh, in in a nutshell, Acora uh, does two things. It's uh, an SEO uh, factor measurement tool, and there's a number of factor measurement tools out there. And what those do is for the factors they know how to measure, they go out to the search results for your keyword and they measure various things and tell you where you stand in comparison to your competitors. And uh, so that's, that's a very important part and you have a lot of choices in the marketplace for factor measurement tools. What makes my software different is that I'm doing statistical correlation on those factors with respect to rankings. So I can tell you which factors it appears that Google is uh, favoring. And because I'm doing that mathematics, when Google does an update, my software automatically adapts to the update. If Google prefers new things, that will be reflected in the very next report you run. And so I'm all about using uh, math and evidence-based methods. And I think that's where the real advantage in SEO comes from, is teasing out those insights from Google's algorithms. Speaking of updates, I know I've, I used Quora to um, combat, well, not necessarily combat these updates, but you will know exactly what changed with Quora, right? That's something that was it's so cool about Quora. When, when you run it, you'll see which factor has moved the needle or moved it down or up. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so what ends up happening is you run these reports at a, you know, specific date and time, and it captures a snapshot of the state of everything at that date and time. So if you have a good archive of reports, you could take a report from before the update and a report from after the update and diff the two to see what changed. And that gives you very good clues on uh, you know, how Google's focus has shifted and how you should respond to a given update. Got it. So, let, okay, let's take this back a little bit. Before Cora. And like you said, you're talking about that like you're writing your own scripts. So how'd you get into SEO? 
tell me your story of how you actually got into it. I mean, I know you were telling, I've, I've heard that your mentor was a rocket scientist before. Um, I can't remember where I heard yep. that, but yeah, you had a rocket scientist mentor. Was he an SEO or like, tell me, yeah, let's take, let's take so it back. Let's take it back. I, I have a long story. I got my start at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois. Uh, when I was a teenager there, uh, I had the office across the hall from Mark Andreessen, who later went on to create Netscape Navigator. Um, so I had access to web browsers, uh, the graphical variety of web browsers, back when it still required a signed NDA with the university to get on the web. And so uh, my... My origin story starts at the beginning of all of that. So I was one of the first people making uh, web pages. I showed all my friends the NCSA Mosaic web browser, and we'd go to the public labs on campus and make websites and do all that stuff. And uh, eventually, during the dot-com era, I got uh, poached by Microsoft, and I worked... Uh, uh, in a marketing think tank with a uh, uh, essentially a rocket scientist. The guy was one of the engineers on the Boeing Delta II program. And apparently Microsoft said, hey, let's hire a rocket scientist and throw marketing problems at him. So I worked in that department, and that guy uh, really instilled a lot of ethics about payload and, and engineering in terms of problem solving. And there's a lot of things that, like, I didn't realize when I entered that uh, situation that I was going to learn about. A uh, number of acquisitions on Microsoft's part, you know, I was doing the data collection. I was writing bots to go analyze companies that we are going to acquire. And he really instilled this concept of payload. He said, Ted, you know, you need to make sure this data, you know, represents the truth, the fact of the matter, the best it can, because what the people are going to use this data for is to determine whether or not after the acquisition, do they keep all the employees or do they rehire and, you know, get new employees? That's people's lives, you mm -hmm. know? And so you can't take the data lightly. And so when you start dealing with acquisitions, you hit all these moral boundaries on, you know, what's the right thing to do. And the same thing uh, is true in SEO. You know, I brought all of that with me into SEO and in that you're trying to tell a business who may have trouble making payroll next month about how they should invest their time and money. That affects lives. You know, mm -hmm. there's still that concept of payload in the work we do. And, you know, from my work ethic, I've always uh, made an effort to try to be worth far more than I cost. And so in that effort to be worth far more than I cost, because I don't want to just pay for myself, I want to pay for myself and the next 20 employees. You know, that's, that's what you want to do if you're working for someone else. And so to do that, you know, I had to create systems. I had to get the information. I had to know that what I was going to do is going to matter. Because at the time, I was working for a large online retailer uh, when I started building my own systems. And uh, the issue with being an in-house SEO is I don't write the website. I don't do the data entry. There are other departments that are doing this work. So I need to get their time to get changes made and to get them scheduled and to get them tested and to get them deployed. So when you're in that type of environment, you can ask for maybe three or four things a year. You need those three or four things to work, especially if your uh, income is based on commissions, based on getting results none of those three or four things can fail. They're too important to fail. So if what you're going to ask them to do has to work every time, guaranteed, how do you do that? 
Well, it turns out the way you do it is you set up testing. And this is how I got into SEO testing. I found uh, the properties of the online retailer that the owners didn't care about, the ones I could experiment on. And so I would run SEO experiments on these small stores that the company wasn't reliant on to survive. And whenever I found successes on those small stores, then I'd ask the engineering team to port it to the big stores. And I only moved the big successes. I knew going into it what the outcome was going to be at the other side. And so I did no risk SEO. I only told them to do successes. And it led to a 17-year engagement. Helped take that retailer from about $5 million a year in revenue up to a a max of about sixty million a year in revenue. Wow! But that's if you get clever. If you get clever, there are ways to eliminate risk in SEO. So going back to um, you said smaller stores. I think I've, I remember watching a presentation of you talking about like just owning uh, the first page. Right? It was more maybe of like um, you would actually rank a product on different was different properties. Is that how you just own like the full top 10 results for the same store? Well, if you look, uh, there, there's a number of online retailers out there that own many brands. And when you find them, they usually have a store for hammocks, they have a store for pottery, they have a store for leather jackets, they have a store for, you know, just ev- everything. All these niche stores, and they'll have dozens and dozens of them. And some of those stores do really well, and some of those stores don't, and many of those stores will share inventory. So in my case, we had uh, about 15 stores that were significant, and uh, they largely overlapped in inventory, maybe uh, 70 to 80% overlap on what products they carried. And so when you would type in a product name, you would see it on all the different store domains. And so because of that overlap, I was able to SEO the whole network of sites and to be able to take a lot more of page one than just one result. So going into Black Friday, it wasn't enough to be number one on Google. I wanted to be all of page one half of page two, at least half of the paid ads, and then have all the other channel marketing options that are available in search. So it was a it, it was about dominating our mm-hmm. keyword space for Black Friday. Got it. I want to take it back to your first conference or the, your first speaking engagement. You talked about negative SEO. I'm curious of um, like how can someone um, find out if they're being targeted with negative SEO and maybe how can they fight it? Like, I'm curious, like, what can we tell? Like, how'd you able to well, figure this out? Yeah. The, the first thing you have to understand is that uh, in terms of negative SEO, uh, the SEO industry has lied to you about it. It may have been an unintentional lie, but they've been lying. You've been taught that negative SEO is spammy backlinks. And while that is a teeny tiny, you know, part of negative SEO, it's not the negative SEO that works. And a lot of people say that, oh, negative SEO isn't real. Well, it isn't real to you because you haven't been targeted by it. But when you get hit by it uh, for Black Friday for an online retailer and you lose your top rankings for the two weeks that generate 80% of your revenue for the year, uh, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. So uh, in in a nutshell, what ended up happening in in my particular case was there was a hacker out there that was competing with similar products and they figured out uh, via the black hat communities that they could do a specific type of network attack on our web servers in order to get them to uh, return 500 errors to visitors. And when Google 
gets a 500 error from uh, Googlebot visiting your website, they de-index your website temporarily. And then when you get re-indexed, you come back in, but like 20% lower in the rankings for about two weeks. And so for a shopping day like uh, Black Friday, uh, that is catastrophic. Like you build up your SEO for the whole year for those days around Black Friday and to lose them is catastrophic. Those those are six figure losses for a medium sized online retailer. And we couldn't tell the the type of attack they were doing on our web server is called a slow loris attack. And the way a slow loris works is they connect to the web server to request a web page. And so you have to give a web request to the server and they decide to slow down the request to where it's ridiculously slow. So it'll be like, hey, web server, please give me the URL H T T P colon <laughs> and you get the idea yeah. so if you slow the web request down it uses up a resource on the web server called uh the connection pool and it's a very limited resource on all web servers and so if they can use up the connection pool they've started serving 500 errors to your visitors and so we are like uh, eventually, I took the chart of the attack of the slow loris attacks, and I overlaid it with the chart of our organic revenue losses. And these feeble attacks, we were able to stop them within an hour every time. It was no problem stopping them, blocking them. And it only lasted an hour. We had no idea that they were successful until we matched up the revenue loss of organic revenue with those attacks. Once we found out that those attacks were an organic revenue attack, I went and hit the Black Hat community over at Black Hat World and said, hey guys, what, what am I doing here? What, how can I respond to this kind of attack? And uh, the, the Black Hats at Black Hat World helped me figure out how I could initially respond. Uh, the first thing we did was we figured out that there is a uh, no cash option, a no cash meta tag that you could put in. They were using our Google cash updates to figure out when Googlebot was on our website. And so once we hid that information, that stopped them for a little bit, but uh, they came back later and uh, it it was pretty bad. Ultimately, we ended up having to buy uh, big IP uh, appliances, security appliances from F5 to be able to automatically detect them mm -hmm. and shut them off. But that's a six-figure solution to a six-figure problem. It wasn't uh, wasn't pretty. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so negative SEO to me isn't what negative SEO is to everyone else. If you're fortunate enough, fortunate enough to not be targeted by it, that's great. But that doesn't mean it isn't real. And it doesn't equate to spammy backlinks. It equates to very real types of attacks that cause very real harm. There was actually one story that you mentioned. Um, it, was, it was kind of funny uh, on, on like how someone within the company actually was doing negative SEO. To, uh, can, can you like... Tell that story of how someone else was doing negative SEO and you couldn't figure it out. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure which one you're referring to. I, I do know of uh, uh, one story where somebody in-house uh, was clicking on their own ads. Uh, and it was unrelated to the company's accounts. So mm -hmm. this was somebody on their own personal account had uh, AdSense and uh. did click fraud on their own ads. The problem with that is that Google is associating every ad ev or every account everybody uses. So even though he used his own personal account, Google banned the company 
you know, at that point was $25, $30 million a year revenue company banned from AdSense. Man. Um, And so because of that, uh, you know, we went probably the better part of 10 years without being able to be in the AdSense program. Wow. So you have to be very careful about letting people use their personal accounts with your business. I think as a matter of, you know, SEO hygiene and, and just marketing hygiene, you need to create a company email address that you control and you need to enforce that they never use their personal accounts at work. Um, you know, you just got to be careful because if somebody ever clicks their own ads on their own accounts and they happen to log into the same computer, well, it could be you getting the 10 year ban next time. Oh, there. there you go, guys. Make sure you separate your accounts, professional, um, personal. I wanted to go into really quick, um, the MC4 algorithm. I've heard you're the only person that talks about it. Uh, I'm curious of, yeah. can you, can you explain to, to the audience like, what is the MC4 algorithm? I know you, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting because, and, and you're the only one talking about it and I wonder why. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an academic pursuit. So the full disclaimer, mm-hmm. uh, we've got our tinfoil hats on here, guys. So this, uh, we're in theory town, uh, MC4 is a web spam algorithm and the idea when it was created was that uh, hey we have people that are discovering exploits how do we detect exploits and block them and so what the mc4 algorithm says is that if uh, some page on the web is exploiting a minority of factors to simply discount those factors. And so if you uh, recall in your own stories, we all know uh, somebody like this, uh, you know, you've probably met someone who discovered that backlinks work. And so they went out and got 10,000 backlinks and they're like, woohoo, I shot up in the rankings. I'm awesome. So Mm -hmm. I I went and got a hundred thousand backlinks and it worked a little more and that was great. So I went and got half a million backlinks and, oh, now it doesn't work anymore. My site went down. And so I went and got a million backlinks and it didn't do anything. Well, that is perfectly explained by an MC4 response. They exploited a minority of factors, and that factor stopped working for them. It didn't stop working for everybody else. Stop stopped working for their URL. Mm. So how do you exploit backlinks in an MC4 world? Well, you make sure that it's not a minority of factors. You diversify your factors. So why can, you know, that number one game site for the keyword online games you know why can they keyword stuff ridiculously why can they have all those spammy backlinks but i can't because they're not using a minority of factors they've diversified whereas you have it so the path to how you can exploit more is to diversify and that's a knowledge bomb right there <laughs> yeah yeah and you know if there's uh you know a a tinfoil hat theory out there that could explain uh more i i don't know it the the mc4 algorithm explains a lot of what we see uh out in the world so the notion that you can have a tier two and you can do spammy link building to that tier two and then that tier two set of websites they just tank in the index they fall out google won't rank it anymore but the link juice, because of the page rank patent, still passes through to the money site. So you can keep linking, you can keep doing spammy links to that tier two that's been de indexed by MC4, but the page rank algorithm lets the value pass through. You know, stuff like that mm-hmm. is just so perfectly explained by Google using something like MC4. Got it. That's such some nuggets right there i mean um speaking of google you've told you've mentioned that you've gotten cease and desist letters from google i mean i'm curious like what is what's one story on this on this cease and desist letters that you get 
that was a long time ago. Okay. Um, but we've all we've all done it in the black cat side. It's the classic <laughs> lesson. I was one of the early birds on the lesson. Mm -hmm. um, I was taking Google search results and I was feeding it back to Google to be indexed as content. And I did it at an epic scale, and it bogged down Google to the point where they had to ask me to stop. And it was working? Uh, it, was... It, it was working fantastically. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was bad. Uh, don't do it. You will get in trouble for <laughs> it. I learned my lesson. Sorry, Google. My bad. <laughs> All right. I mean, but, I get, yeah. Uh, you know, it, don't don't do it if if you the concept of that uh experiment that you should take away is that a content database is an amazingly powerful thing if there is a topic that you are passionate about you want to make a content database about that topic get all the information get all the data you can get all the things people like to look up about that topic create the ultimate fan site for that topic with amazing content and an amazing database. And that that's just going to work. And, you know, I did it without having an interest in a topic. I just kind of pilfered topics out of uh, Google search results. Uh, but really the key there is content databases and large websites do work. There you go. Another bomb. Man, you're dropping bombs all day here. Content databases, think about that. Okay, and really quick before we go, um, I know we're kind of running out of time here. I want to show you this video. Um, there's something that you've actually mentioned before, how um, Google, uh, things that used to work in Google that stopped working 10 years ago are now working again. And I want to show you this because I actually found this on... Um, on, on another different video podcast and it's it's about like how, how google works and i'm curious this kind of validates what you you say like on how you feel that what worked that stopped working 10 years ago is working now let's take a, take a look steve is a uh, now retired former google engineer he is he's he's obviously made enough money now that he doesn't have to actually work in fact if you look at his bio Steve Yegi is ex GeoWorks, ex Amazon, ex Google, and ex Grab with nearly 30 years of tech experience. Nowadays, he's pretty much retired. In other words, his stock vested. The headline Dear Google Cloud, your deprecation policy is killing you. I don't even know why he added the cloud part, but I guess it's because uh, this post is really about what's going on in the cloud. SEO, baby. Yeah. But. Yeah, SEO maybe, but really, you could say this is true about Google in general. They honor peop engineering teams that kill legacy old code. And again, he's talking about the cloud, but I think this applies to all of Google. Google engineers, he says, pride themselves on their software engineering discipline. And that's actually what gets them into trouble. Pride is a trap for the unwary. And it has ensnared many a Google team into thinking their decisions are always right. And that correctness is more important than customer focus. So you've talked about this before. Like, I'm curious, like, and, and I think that validates, right? Like how you're saying, like, maybe, like, maybe new engineers come in, come out, and they just kill code. What's, I mean, I want your opinion on that. And also, what's something maybe that was killed back then that works now? Well, uh, let's let's unpack what we just saw there because they okay. they were kind of discussing two topics. Mm -hmm. So the the first one was the original comment made about the Google Cloud and mm -hmm. their deprecation policy. If you build applications on cloud infrastructure, what generally happens if you like get it running and then walk away and come back a year later, you come back to a broken application because they will change things on the cloud side. So you get this natural entropy. Whereas if I get cheap hosting and I install the technology I want to use on there and I build an application and get it working and walk away for a year, I come back, it's still working. I don't have this deprecation policy that slowly breaks everything over time. And so that's just the nature of the beast for cloud development. And that's what he was complaining about. 
this other notion that uh, 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 Google will forget how things work and will accidentally break code that was there for a reason, uh, that's also true. Uh, that's just a cost of doing maintenance. When you have attrition in your engineering team and you have massive amounts of code and not all of it is understood to the same degree as the original authors had, you're bound to get someone to go in there and go, I don't know what this does. I'm going to comment it out because it's causing problems. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, keyword stuffing works again. Then all of a sudden, you, you're no longer blocked from putting in emoji check marks as a trust signal into your meta description. That works again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, stuff, stuff like that happens when you uh, get out of innovation mode in a technology company and you get into maintenance mode. And like most companies, you know, 90% of your costs are in maintenance and Google's learning those lessons now, but it's, it's great for us SEOs because what was old is new again. And that's another reason why we measure and test, you know, and countless times in, you know, the chat uh, threads on SEO Roundtable and other, other websites, you know, they... They always give the black cats hell, you know, they, they laugh and mock at them. Aha, you think it's 2007? Well, tell you what, you know, rhinoplasty plano, paint by numbers, keyword tuning, did the trick, got to number one in Google, what's old is new again. Big advice right there. What's old is new again. Remember that, guys. So if you've learned something, if you've been an SEO for quite some time now, um, go back to maybe some of those old ebooks and, and, and maybe take a look and see what's going on there. Um, again, we're coming close to, we're actually over, coming close to time, but before that, I want to ask, uh, ask you, Ted, I asked this to uh, all the SEO professionals on here. Um, if someone wants to get into SEO, what would you tell them to do? What, what's, what's some advice that you give someone that wants to get into SEO? I mean, this is some, I would create this show to help others get into the, the, the industry. It's three times more job postings than SEMs, and it has a 200% increase since January of SEO professionals. Let's, it's a hot topic. It's, it's a hot you know, position, hot job. How can someone get into it? All right. Um, well, first of all, not all SEO jobs are the same. So, you know, I often mention that, you know, SEO for local is very different than enterprise SEO. Mm -hmm. SEO at agencies is very different than in-house SEO. So it really depends what the opportunities you're facing are as to what types of work you'll actually be doing and how you'll be doing that work. Uh, if you are trying to get an in-house SEO job, I think the important thing is that you have to be able to be a translator, a, a technology and marketing translator for the whole business. Because the fights you're going to be fighting are going to be trying to do the right things for revenue, but you have to get the engineering team to do the work. You have to get the product loading team to use the policies you said about naming things. You have to translate to the email team why they should care about uh increasing uh, the SEO tuning because it also impacts quality score for pay-per-click. And what it really comes down to is you're going to be an evangelist who's also doing this technical work. Uh, and you really have to sell the company on the mission that SEO lifts all boats. And when done properly, it does that. It does that very well. But, you know, understand that you're going to be working with multiple business units. And if you can communicate that to the people who are hiring, they're, they're going to see that you're going to be a valuable asset no matter what you bring to the table. There you go. Yep. Um, on SEO Fight Club, I, 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 the first time I've heard, heard of this, like you actually are launching... Uh, a lick building course. I want to like for everyone listening out there. Can you like let everyone know like how they can get a hold of you? Or, like tell us a little more about this link, um, this link building course, because uh, I'm curious myself. And where can we find it? Yeah, 
I'm uh, currently uh, creating the videos for it. I have all the content produced. It's called low-level link building. And that's the art of getting backlinks one link at a time. And there's a limited window in the life cycle of a website to do that kind of link building before there's diminishing returns. And so I go into uh, when you want to use it, how do you do it, I go over 40 different types of backlinks. I give you ways of identifying thousands of sources of those. And most of them could be obtained in minutes. And so the idea is that for people who have new websites who want to get to that middle tier where this is applicable, I want to give them uh, the best practices of doing safe link building and to be able to do that type of link building efficiently. The, uh, the important part, I know that most SEOs are like, well, I want to use software and services and generate, uh, you know, a quarter million backlinks right away. You know, those next level bulk strategies are typically what gets you into trouble. And I want to teach the foundation that helps keep you out of trouble. Nice. And where can we find it? Uh, this will be available at Internet Marketing Gold. We are pivoting Internet Marketing Gold to be more about courses and mm -hmm. access to courses and affordable access to courses. Mm -hmm. So expect an announcement in the near future uh, about our new offering in courses. And I think you'll be impressed. And my link building course will be one of many amazing courses on the platform. Love it. I mean, guys out there, uh, Internet Marketing Gold, IMG, you've heard me talk about it. I'm a member over there. It's a great community. Uh, Ted, Kyle, and Clint, who was here last week, um, are all part of, uh, are in there just talking. It's a great community. Um, again, so like, what, where else can, um, they can find you on IMG and also what, an SEO Fight Club? I'm wearing my... T-shirt from my SEO Fight Club. Oh, you're so lucky! Yeah, I, I didn't so even get one of those. <laughs> yeah, I was I was one of the first. Where can I get one? I, hey, I was. You got to sign up at um, IMG. Be one of the first members to ever sign up as uh, before it wasn't built. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's awesome. So, thank you, Ted. I want to um, do something. Rewind. This is where I rewind everything, and I take it back a few years. Um, I'm actually taking it back uh, more than a few years. You, this is this is something that um, I love ending with a musical note, and this is something that you know you were able to share with me, and I appreciate it. And I want to play it for the audience. Here we go. You don't give them that easy You don't give up everything you've known Yesterday is like the other day And thus the day before he lies your friend here beneath the ground. Didn't you know yesterday that they always even the score? Yesterday 
like the other day Thus the day before He lies a friend Here beneath the ground Didn't you know yesterday That the shots would sound 